All right, it's time for the anchor man, the last guy between us and the drinks, right? And what's important about the drinks is that they're cool, so we can refer to the cooling guy some way. Um, I'm Steve Legensky from Intelligent Light, um, a small company based in New Jersey, and we do a lot of things to help people be more productive with CFD, and CFD consumes a lot of HPC cycles, so that's kind of why I come to these meetings and participate. And uh, before I start, I wanted to really thank the guys here, uh, the HPC User Forum guys. Um, I'm glad they have a new life. Uh, for me, this participating in these events has helped my company learn a lot about the requirements of HPC. Remember years ago, we were talking about software licensing is like a big problem and uh, costs and that kind of led us to think about it and we adopted this kind of open source no license fee strategy on the HPC side and these are really great guys so what you all have to do is outreach to your colleagues to get more people to participate in these meetings we need like the next wave of HPC people so that's my commercial so I'm going to talk today about in situ for post-processing and uh, why it matters and what this all has to do about is um, large file creation, large file storage. So um, I'll give some background about this, but in situ really means trying to get the simulation results from the solver memory without having to write and read giant files. Um, and this is my kind of favorite chart of doom, which shows that from 1979 to 2011, even though disk capacity has increased 100,000 fold, uh, speed has increased 72-fold. So that's a, that's a fact of life. And, and people talk about retrograde performance in CPUs and clock speeds, but in terms of disk, this is kind of the fact of life. And, and burst buffers and solid-state uh, disk is all great, but the size of the files created by CFD really puts us into a problem uh, with this issue. So first I'm going to give some background, kind of explain where we're coming from. So. The historical CFD scenario, for those of you who don't know what CFD is about, is you build a mesh or some kind of a discretization of a domain, then you try to get everything right in your dusty 80 character Fortran style deck, submit your job, and hopefully it'll run. And when it does run, it creates files. And the files are big, and I'll give some examples. Uh, there's lots of files. And these files are considered to be precious. It's like the result of your work. And it's, it's kind of an interesting um, psychological situation, right? That I did all this work to build a mesh and get this run to go. This file is precious to me. And sometimes people forget that really what you need is the result, the knowledge from the file and not the file itself. So once you have these files and you do the post-processing, supposedly that's where you're going to get your answer. That's where you're going to find out whether a thing is going to fly, or whether it's going to catch on fire, or whether the aeroacoustics are going to blow it up, whatever. And this is a fact of life, that this issue about storage comes into the planning when people do simulations. And they say, you know, I'd like to do all these other runs, but there's no way I'm going to be able to store the results. And someone from one of the large manufacturers that presented today has told me that they only look at 10% of what they compute. So actually, science engineering is being limited by people planning ahead and saying, I can't possibly store these files. So this, we thought, would be a worthwhile problem to go after. And so uh, that's what, what in situ is intended to deal with. So historically, one solution to this problem is, well, batch processing, right? So you use some scripts on the HPC system. You let uh, software create some movies or some standardized plots and you come to a meeting with your standardized plots and your movies, and that way you never have to really move those big files off the HPC system. They stay there, okay? And uh, that works great. Um, I think one of the most of American industries, certainly automobile industry, works this way. Standardized plots are required. And um, one of the issues there is, however, is that if you don't know what you're looking for, you may not get in a standardized plot. Or more importantly, if the standardized plot causes your boss to say, why? And you don't have the answer. So you want to go back and look at that big volume file, then you're stuck again. You have to have some ability to work with some of that valuable data that's in the file. 
So something we've been advocating for about five years, and it was actually invented or originated at NASA Ames by Al Globus uh, many years ago, was this idea of an extract workflow. So instead of just making a picture, um, take the result file on the HPC system, read it into some post-processing software, and write this smaller extract file. Example, um, those combustor pictures we looked at earlier today, you had the geometry of the combustor can, and you had some cuts with temperature or something on it. So that's a can and some cuts. The file may be six gigabytes in size, but the can and the cuts is about 100 megabytes. So you take the, the important parts of the file and you write them into this extract, and then you just FTP that to your local system. And because the extract is full fidelity to what's in the solver file, you can rotate it, you can change the variables, you can make an animation with it, and the, you are making the compromise that if you put a cut here, and you need a cut there, you've got to go back to the volume file to get that other cut. But if you're already using standardized plots, this gives you a lot more, an ability to work with something in 3D. And the real big problem, and it was great because I had all these great people leading up to my talk today, is unsteady CFD. So CFD means computational fluid dynamics, which is the computational uh, method applied to fluid dynamics. And it's not statics. Fluid dynamics means things are, are moving, they're changing, they're combusting. And uh, a great slide we showed today showed RANS versus LES. And people knew that CFD is unsteady, but there's no way they could compute it in the past. Ah, but now we have HPC. We can compute these unsteady solutions. The problem is what do you do with them? And so extracts become very important for an unsteady case where you have a thousand time steps, you have a thousand combustor cans and a thousand cut planes, and you want to be able to work with them. So this is kind of today uh, in terms of what a lot of people use. We have customers using this from uh, Formula One, uh, aerospace. Uh, it's, it's, it's getting to be a standard way to do things. So these extracts, I talked about this idea that you, know, you have this surfaces, the combustor can and the slice. And they actually, there's actually a spectrum of extracts, right? An extract is a subset of computed results that's extracted from the volume file for some purpose. Could be numbers in a file, like lift and drag. Could be images and animations, like standard plots. It could also be 3D PDF. That's something we've been working with for the last few years. That's cool because you can give somebody a PDF output that they can load on a tablet and rotate and zoom and do things with. Uh, there's a technology from Los Alamos called Cinema, which are movies and images that carry data. So instead of storing pixels in a file, you store scalar results. And then you could later convert those to color. That's kind of an interesting idea. We have our 3D surface and lines uh, extracts, and they carry the full field data. I want to get to that again. Like, if you do a cutting plane and you want to do mass flow across a plane, you have to do, get some variables and do an integration. So using our extracts, if you take that cut plane out after the fact and do the integration, it's exactly the same to machine precision as though you did it in the volume file. And that's the key, is the extract really mimics the exact content, the lossless content of the volume file. And I asked some questions today about the DMD and reduced order statistical models. This, I think, is the next phase of doing extracts because not only is it a method to compress or reduce the size of the data, but it's a form of machine learning where you can use um, single value decomposition or proper orthogonal decomposition to extract the major uh, state spaces from an unsteady solution, help you actually understand what's there. And so it has a lot more value, and that's, that's an area we're working in currently. We have something called an EXDB, where instead of storing the whole time sequence, you just store the modes. You put, plug in T, and it reconstructs whatever time step that you want. So that's kind of the whole space of extracts. So now we get to in situ, right? So in situ is the process of instrumenting the simulation with a, a module. I'm using a visit LibSim here as an example. And that code interfaces directly with the variable memory in the solver. So when you want to do that cut or do that can, 
It's extracting that data directly from the solver memory. The way it works is very simple. When the solver reaches the bottom of an iteration, you pause the solver, do a zero copy access to the variables and geometry and memory, create the extract, and take the much smaller thing and write that to disk. So there is no volume file. The volume file becomes optional. And I use that very carefully, right? I mentioned that psychological thing in the beginning. People's volume files are precious. So we're not saying don't write volume files, but they're optional. So maybe if I'm doing an unsteady calculation, I can save an extract every time step, but I save the volume file every thousand time steps, like a restart file or something like that. So you can have control over your destiny when it comes to these files. The, uh, the key point to this goes to my introduction, which is the software that we provide for the instrumentation, the solver code, is based on an open source tool from Department of Energy called Visit. Visit has a module in it called LibSim. Visit's a full featured open source Viz package that we now provide commercial support for. But the LibSim port has, portion has no license fees. So we team with companies, we help them integrate LibSim, but there is no license fee for the actual process. That wouldn't scale. I mean, that'd be a bummer, right? If I, if I had to pay per core, that would be like some other software companies make you do. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and what else is cool for the user is the XDB workflow, the, the extract workflow from in situ is the same as you had done it from files. So compared to the previous slide where I in batch used a script and wrote an extract, once I have extract, it's exactly the same for the user at the local workstation. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, support from uh, phase two SPIR from Department of Energy. Uh, there's a contract number there. And we not only use Visit in Leibson, but we use something called Adios, which is a very cool uh, software package that allows simulation codes to do a really good job of parallel I.O. And, you know, I wasn't joking before when I said that most, you know, solvers are driven by a Fortran-style input deck. Almost all solvers uh, write out through rank zero. So you compute on 100,000 cores, and then you consolidate everything to rank zero and write it out. So LibSim lets you do I.O. from all the cores in parallel, and it essentially lets you defer what you're doing. Are you going to write a file, or are you going to transmit that information to another series of processes in the HPC machine? So it's very good stuff. I encourage you to take a look at it. It's all uh, Department of Energy, great code. So in situ, besides saving on the uh, disk space also saves on solver time. This is what our hope was, okay? Because stopping the solver to get all the data from all those partitions, bring it down to rank zero and write it out takes time. So this is an exact, this is a real example. It's a notional helicopter from Georgia Tech and uh, it's the create, government create Kestrel code which we've instrumented with LibSim. And we're writing these extracts every five solver iterations. There's some speeds and fees numbers for the grid size. But if we wrote the volume data every five iterations, it would take 30% of wall clock time. So that means if you needed unsteady data set, solved at that rate, 30% of your HPC time would not be solving the equations. It would be doing I.O. So again, as I pointed out earlier, the, the transient issue, the fact that everything's going to unsteady, really amplifies this problem and also amplifies the benefit. So in this example, we created a cut plane extract, uh, a geometry surface extract, um, an, a geometry surface extract for the blade, and an isosurface of Q criterion to show the vortex behavior. So there's four extracts per time step. Those four extracts per time step were 21 times smaller than the volume files. And we saved those extracts, but now this is one session in a post-processing software. You can create multiple views, you could change variables. It's really like having the full volume data at your fingertips, but it's using these extracts. So you saved, you went from a 30% of wall clock time to 3%, 
and 21x savings in disk space using extracts. Now, of course, there's a compromise, right? If I now I, I, I go to show my boss and he says, I want to cut right there. Well, then you got to go back to the volume data and you got to create that cut. So what we typically do is we anticipate the boss and generate lots of cuts in every direction. Because they're 21 times smaller, you can be sloppy on the creation and then don't have to worry about recreating it again on the other side. And some of these reduced order methods, um, we can use that not only for time, but we can do, say, for example, a proper orthogonal decomposition with respect to x and then reconstruct any cut plane along that x sweep to meet the boss's command. So, so that's the basis of in situ. That's the background. And now I'm going to go through some industry app, you know, app, actual examples and applications as, I, uh, as the title of the talk promised. So here's a summary list um, of some of the people that we're currently working with and have worked with. So DOD's Defense Department, Create AV, both uh, AV and Helios are Defense Department funded codes for um, kind of standardized simulation. It's part of acquisition reform. The government runs simulations too to make sure that the contractors selling them airplanes aren't fibbing about performance and things like that. And uh, that's, a very, that's been a big program. That's been uh, 35 million a year for 10 years to develop these codes. And these are now open source codes available to the US government and contractors. Uh, NASA, we've instrumented uh, two codes. We work with Langley and NASA Ames. I'll talk about that. Uh, Corvid Technologies, it's a small company. Uh, they do, it's actually a cool HPC story. It's a very small company, but they have probably five or 10,000 cores of HPC. They do very tricky problems for a defense department, uh, such as making sure that the next generation Humvees are safer for uh, warfighters. So just a side thing, right? So when, a, when you're driving one of these vehicles and a Imp, what do they call them? IED goes off, it blasts the vehicle, every piece inside the vehicle becomes potentially a bullet, every bolt, every nut. So they did all the simulation to help prove that the three contractors who were providing these new generation vehicles were actually making them safer. And to do that, they have a structural mechanics code, and uh, we did in situ uh, instrumentation for them. A company I can't name, I'll, I'll talk about that in detail. Uh, JAXA, which is kind of the Japanese uh, NASA, we've got two projects with them. Uh, one, a uh, Formula One team who uses extract workflows from us now and they're going to, they're going to be moving to Unsteady. So we have an in situ project going on with them. And that's an interesting project because again, I can't mention it here, but that's one of the largest commercial codes in the US is now going to have the ability to write the extracts directly. So I think that's going to start to change things with uptake. And then the Dimitri Mavropoulos University of Wyoming. And then I'll show one of our uh, kind of high watermark examples. OK, so this is the Create AV example. And this was the, the problem statement was uh, they needed many seconds of 3D CFD. And it was going to be computed at the Maui Supercomputer Center, which I don't know how that ever worked out that the Army has an HPC center on Maui. But it's really true. So they were computing on Maui. And uh, these are many, many gigabytes per time step, these results files. And they had to analyze them in Pax River, Maryland. So they called us and they said, help. Uh, so we helped uh, the guy, Jim Forsyth was the guy actually doing the project. We supported him in instrumenting his Kestrel code with Visit LibSim. And this again showed about a 21x reduction in size. And this case here, what you're seeing is 45 seconds of CFD. First of all, that's a long time. And it's at 60 hertz. But what's interesting is that the helicopter is actually flying itself. It's a full six degree of freedom simulation. The helicopter blades are pitching and moving themselves. There's a flight simulator software that's doing a goal uh, directed operation, which is fly to the back of the ship, wait five seconds there for the go, and then land. And the whole point of this is to show how complex the uh, flow becomes when the helicopter ingests the wake from the ship. Current state of the art is steady state input condition for helicopter flight sim for landing. 
and the pilots notice there's a big difference. I, I won't show the other animation, but there's another animation that actually shows that on the side where you ingest the unenergized air, the helicopter tilts to one side as you come down. So this was meant to be, the movie was not made as the result. The movie was to prove that the helicopter was actually flying to the ship and not landing in the water, right? But the, the result was essentially plots of torque and input before and after so they could prove to the government that this was necessary. And there's now a current project funded by uh, NAVAIR that's going on with Penn State to create reduced order, unsteady boundary conditions for the CFD. So this is by standards of people who do CFD. This is, a, I think you can appreciate the scope of this project. And it wouldn't have been possible without the in situ uh, result. What I'm very proud of is that was a one-off. And now that we did that in 2013, now it's 2017. And this is now a production tool in Create. So designers have a standard in situ workflow for designing aircraft and helicopters. So that's kind of a, that's a big success for us. Uh, NASA, there's two codes primarily. We've worked with Overflow 2 and Fund 3D. Uh, Fund 3D was the first NASA project. We worked with uh, Bill Jones at NASA Langley, and he actually presented at the HPC User Forum in 2013. Um, and so that's his code, Fund 3D. Then we undertook to instrument the popular Overflow 2 code. We work with Peter Buning. That's currently being handed off to uh, David Gao at NASA Ames. And that's, that's really a code that's used by a lot of American aerospace industry, so that'll have an impact. Um, and we have been using Overflow 2 for another project we have on large-scale non-deterministic engineering and uncertainty quantification. So we're actually using in situ to scrape the surface results from the solver and take the extracts and put them in a database, which are subsequently processed by the Dakota software from Sandia. University of Wyoming, we're here to talk this morning about wind turbines, something like on the order of 100. Well, here's 47 being done now. It's a 10 by 10 kilometers, 1.1 billion degrees of freedom. Uh, they have their own higher order CFD code. They're saving about 10 to 12 fold for computing and saving. And, you know, the, the, uh, just to give you an idea, here's 10 terabytes for 12 hours. And they want to be able to take in weather from the atmospheric boundary layer, so they want to run for days. So the data size is huge. And there's th that's the top view, by the way, of the layout of the 47 wind turbines there. We're very active in Japan. So uh, JAXA, we supported their launch team. It's kind of interesting. There's a new launch code being made at Ames. And, and launch, launch aeroacoustics is a big deal. Because when a rocket is, is going, the motor's generating huge acoustic waves, which can have problems for not only where you're launching it, but the rocket itself. So that's unsteady. Um, that result will be presented at PAR CFD 17 in Scotland. I'll be presenting there as well. And there'll be a scotch tasting there. Good conference to attend. Um, and then the unnamed customer, which is kind of the largest aerospace company in Japan, they wanted to be able to do, to bring LES into design. So they wanted to be able to have unsteady LES aeroacoustics go into optimization. That's heavy, because that's a lot of data to be able to, to assimilate, to be able to do things with. So at Intelligent Light, this is kind of, we're proud of this. This is a co-op research grant we have with DOE Oscar with the Berkeley Labs. And we instrumented the AVF Leslie code, which is a combustion code. This is just a test case, but this is a thermal mixing layer. So you just kind of have two fluids and you let them go. And we ran this up to 130,000 cores uh, on Titan. Uh, and this is one where we use both MPI write groups and Adios. So we could have all those cores coordinating I.O. And then we redid the XDB format to be a parallel format. So now the extracts are parallel. So it's end to end parallel. So, so the, to do in situ, Fundamentally, your solver code needs to be instrumented. Uh, we do the visit LibSim modules, what we advocate. There are other things out there, Catalyst. Some codes have built-in stuff. We're agnostic to how you do extracts. We just advocate people, use extracts whenever you can. Um, some codes can compute basic extracts. We have another uh, uh, code. It's not open source, but it's license-free. 
It's a BSD style license uh, called XDB Lib, and uh, solver companies can integrate that into their solver code and write these extracts. And we provide this service thing. I dug the guy's slide with the tent. Uh, we work closely with people that have solver codes to help them integrate and make productive uh, workflows. And we've, through our Department of Energy work, we've done work both with Blue Gene Q and Intel based stuff on, on Titan. So that's, my la that's the end of my talk. Um, again, thank you guys very much for making these things happen. And uh, if I can take some questions, I'll do that. But I don't want to stand in the way of everybody and the uh, beverages. So on that note, I'll say thanks. <laughs> <laughs>